Hi and welcome to Squiz.com, the connected marketplace. Today I'll be showing you the latest and greatest changes we've made to the Squiz.com connector in a 1.15 release. Squiz.com connector is a free piece of software developed by us that allows a business to connect any of its business software, databases, spreadsheets, or files storing data into the Squiz.com and Todex platforms. It allows businesses to save and make more money by automating data management and data transfer between its systems and other supplier and customer systems. Now you understand what the connector can do, let's look at the changes added to the 1.15 connector release. This release adds new functionality into the datasets feature, allowing image and attachment files to be assigned to products, as well as allowing products to be related to other products. We introduced concepts of datasets back within the 1.10, 1.11 and 1.12 connector release videos, and I'll be talking more about the datasets in this video. So if you are unfamiliar with the datasets feature, I highly recommend watching these videos first before continuing on. You can find links to the release videos within this YouTube's video's long description. This release also adds new functionality to allow the connector's MyOB account write adapter to be able to export and import data into MyOB's account write cloud platform that is hosting a company's data. Companies may wish to have their data hosted in MyOBS Cloud to avoid having to manage their own computer hardware and networking, and when this occurs, the account write adapter in, within the connector can be configured to read and write data over the internet and into MyOBS Cloud APIs to access the company file data. In this release, the generic adapter within the connector has been modified so that when it exports out category data, that the category product data export no longer needs to be configured. This allows more flexibility when setting up and exporting out category data. Lastly, a small change has been made to the DataPal warehouse management system adapter so that when it imports sales orders into DataPal's WMS system, it puts the order line's product name data into the warehouse management system's order line description field. This matches up more consistently with the kind of product data that is imported from the connector. Before I get started to the changes to the datasets feature, feel free to subscribe to the Squiz.com YouTube channel to stay informed when we release new great functionality in the future. Within the 1.15 connector release, we've added new functionality into datasets to be able to assign image and other files to products, as well as to set up item relations between products and other products. If we click on the datasets tab, I have an existing data set that I've created here that we've been using in the past connector videos. If I click on the view button, we can see all the existing products that we've Im imported in previous release videos. As well, we can see that there are now three new tabs that have been added to the data set window. This is images, attachment, and item relations. So first of all, we'll go click on the images tab. Images tab allows us to assign image files against our products. And this is useful when we want to assign images to products and display those images when our customers and users view those products in the associated e-commerce platforms. Once we've assigned our images to our products, then the adapters within the connector can find these images and upload the products to the associated e-commerce platforms. So the first thing that we can see here is the list of all the products that have been imported into the data set can also be seen within the products tab. So with our list of products already within the data set, we just need to go through each product and find the image file that needs to be assigned against that product. So we've got a cotton t-shirt that is in a small red size. So if we click on the browse button, it then opens up an explorer window when we can navigate on our computer and find our images files. So we're talking about a small red t-shirt, a cotton t-shirt, and I've got a few images that are available here. I simply click on the image file, click the open button, and now the path of the image file is now stored within this column. And now if we scroll across further, we can see that within the image preview column, we can now see a preview of that image as well. So we've assigned this image to the cotton t-shirt small red. Now there's another column here called key image ID. So this field, we need to set a unique identifier for this image. And the reason for that is that if in the future we wanted to change the image and we wanted to use a different image file, we need to tell the e-commerce platform that the image is being uploaded against that it needs to update an existing image rather than assign a new image to the product. So by being able to give images unique identifiers, it makes it easy for those e-commerce platforms to find the image that we're wanting to change. So this key image ID, we could give it a value of one. We could also give it the same name as such as the image file. But it's important to note that if we wanted to use the same image file for different products, that we would have to make this key image ID unique. So that's what we do. That's what I'm doing here. I'm just putting a unique identifier for this image. 
So once we've done that, there's also another couple of fields that we've got available for an image. We can set the image a title, and that title may display if a user hovers over the image on the e-commerce platforms that are displayed. As well as we've got a description field where we, we can provide an extended description of what the image shows or what the image represents. So we could just keep this a quite a simple title such as t cotton t-shirt. So then we could extend that description and we could extend that description as we can see here to provide more information about that image. And then that data could also be displayed by the e-commerce platforms in different various forms, uh, such as if users click on the image, that description could appear uh, underneath it or next to it, or however they want to use that data. Just like in all the other different types of data we set up within a data set, we have the is active and is updated fields, which are useful if we're importing image data from other systems and we want to know which records have been updated from those systems and which ones are not being updated when the data is being imported and merged up. As well as we've got the date times to show us when we're, we're modifying the data and we've got a notes column to be able to provide any additional information we want to know about these records when setting them up. So it's as simple as that. So our next product here, we need to find then a blue t-shirt. So I just go in there, choose the image, and then that's now assigned against it. And then our next one here, we have got a small green t-shirt. So we go through and choose that as well. Now, we might not want to go through the file browser for each image because we already know the path to it. So we can just copy the path and paste that into wherever we want to assign that image. So we've got another green top here. And we can do the same for our red t-shirts, just copy the path into those images as well. And the connector will automatically try to load that image. There's an important aspect to these image file paths that you need to be aware about. And that is the drive letter that appears at the start of the path. In my example here, my computer has a physical hard disk that is mapped to the C drive. In some business computer networks, the drive that is set up may be called a network drive and that means that the hard disk that actually stores image data is not on the on my computer where the connector is installed it is on a different computer that is accessible over the computer network such as if we had a a D drive for example and that D drive could be a network drive that is stored on another server or location now this becomes a problem if you've got what we call a mapped network drive on your computer that has been set up for the Windows user that you log into Windows with. Now this isn't a problem for the connector application because it is able to use your Windows profile in order to find where the D drive maps to, the hard disk that stores that image. It becomes a problem for the connector's Windows service. If I open up the services window that it shows us all the different software that is running in the background of Windows, one of those services is called the Squiz.com connector and that is the Squiz.com connector host service. This service does not particularly run as any specific Windows user. It runs as the generalized system Windows user. And what that means is it doesn't have access to the mapped network drive. So if you've got a D drive on your computer, which is a mapped network drive, the Windows service will most likely not see the mapped network D drive. And because of that, when we try to use the connector to upload the image, the connector service is going to throw an error saying it cannot find the file. So how do we get around this? There's a few ways in which we can do that. Rather than using mapped network drives, we instead use what is called UNC, which stands for Universal Naming Convention. And instead we put in the name of the computer, my, my file server, which is the name of the computer, which the drive that stores the images is called. And then after that, then we use the, the folder path to where that image is located. So that is something to be aware of if you are trying to sign images two products where the image files are stored on different computers within your network. You want to use the UNC file path as opposed to map network drives to do this. And that increases the chances of the Windows host being able to find the images when it needs to upload them to the associated e-commerce platform. So for now, I'll just put that back as my C drive and then the image will come back up again. So once we've signed our images, we need to set the key image ID this is where it's easiest just to put in unique identifiers. Now you may want to use the internal ID, which is specified for each of these records. Now, if you want to assign multiple images to one product, all we need to do is get the key product ID. And then within the last row, we can create a new record. 
and then we we find the associated image and then we can continually we can add multiple and this is allows us to add multiple image files to the same product we click on the find reload data button and we scroll back down to that image you can see that that same small green cotton t-shirt has now got two images that have been assigned to it that will guarantee that these these image IDs are unique and now we've got all of, all the data necessary to be able to use the connectors to upload these images against the products that have been set up here to export the product image data from a data set we just need to set up a generic adapter and then we sit, need to set that generic adapter to be able to read data from a SQLite database once we set up that data source type then within the data exports we find the product images data export assign it to our data set now the table that stores the product image data within the data set is called product image and after that we also may want to only get active product image records out so we put in a custom condition here save those settings then if we click on the data fields option we can just copy and paste all the the standards fields names paste them into here and we just adjust these since the names of the columns within the data set are just slightly different to what's listed here so we just shorten these to image description and title we can test this out by clicking on the test export query button and if all goes well click the run query and then we can see all the data that was available in our data set is now available it is going to be exported out of here once we've got that all configured reload the data fields then we can go back into the adapter and when, then we can click on the export product images select our platform that we want to upload the product images into and click the run once off button or we can have that run on a scheduled basis so once that happens the connector host service will then iterate through each of the product image records that you've set up within the data set and upload them one by one to the associated uh, connected e-commerce platform the last thing to note is when you're assigning product image files products you want to use jpeg image files gif image files or png image files because they're the ones that are most popular within the browsers on the websites and the e-commerce platforms may even block you from being able to upload other image types if you're uploading jpeg files you need to ensure that the jpeg files is saved in the rgb color profile format so when you take photos with some cameras they can be saved in different color formats compatible with the with web browsers as well as different e-commerce platforms so by saving them in the rgb color profile format then that ensures that those images will be correctly uploaded and viewed in the associated e-commerce platforms if you are unsure of that there are many tools out there to be able to do bulk changes on how to save images uh, in the correct uh, image format now if we click on the attachments tab we can do the same thing that we did for image files we can also upload non-image based files or any kind of file against our product data so just like how we had in the images tab in the attachments tab you can see the list of all the products that are saved within the data set we just need to go through each product and we just need to find the associated file that we want to upload against that so if we take our example cotton t-shirts again and we click on the browse button I have a folder on my computer called product attachments I've got a t-shirt sizing chart PDF file which allows users to see if the t-shirt size would work for them so we simply choose our file click the open button and now an attachment file record has been attached to that product and just like before we need to give it a unique identifier for that record so we'll just use the same internal ID in order to set the key attachment ID and we can also give this file a title so we'll give it a, a title t-shirt sizing chart and just like with the other data types we've got the is active is updated date fields and the note fields where we can put in information instead of having an image viewer to see the file we we can click on the view button to, in order to view that file whichever file windows set up to view those files in so if we click the view button here that for me opens up this PDF file into the Chrome browser because I've configured Chrome to be able to open up all PDF files. But if PDF files were opened up in an Adobe viewer, then that viewer would open up from there as well. Now, if you want to assign multiple attachments to the one product, and the same goes for product images, we need to just copy the key product ID. Within the last row of the table is the new row. We put in the unique identifier of the product. If it finds it, it will load up all the details of the product, and then we can just find the second file. So we've got a warranty file that we've got here, and then we can also view that. So there's an example warranty file that comes with that product. The same case goes for 
product images, we can copy and paste the paths and any other data about these files. If the files are located on network drives that we use UNC paths, the computer name or the IP address to that machine within the full file path. And we want to set unique identifiers for each of the files. So we'll copy them. Now we've got a, a number of attachment records that have been created for each of the products that we have here. Once again, if we go back into the adapters, if we want to export that attachment file data and have it uploaded to the associate e-commerce platform, we need to set up a generic adapter. We find the product attachments export type. We assign it to our SQLite database source. The attachment file data is stored in the data sets product attachment table and then we would also want to only upload uh, attachment data that is active so we'll put in that condition we save those settings then within the data fields we mapped all the data fields and we just have to slightly adjust the names based on what's in the data set uh, so the file path is set to the full file path column and the attachment title is just called title within the data set we can really reload those fields within the adapter to update the connector window service to have those updated settings. Then after that, we go back into the export routines window. We find the product attachment, the product attachments export, choose the platform that we want to upload those attachment files to and click the run once off or we schedule that to run on a regular basis. Each week or two, depending on how often you're, you're creating new attachment data and you're uploading it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it daily especially if you've got lots of large data, such as files in megabytes size, because then you could be uh, uploading quite a lot of data repetitively that you don't need to. Last tab we added to the data set is called item relations. Within this tab, this allows us to relate one product to another product. And this is handy if you're on a website and you view one product and you have a section saying, here's some other products that you may like as well. These come under the terms of item relations where we're gonna assign one product to another product. So if we go back to, into our t-shirts, our medium t-shirts, you could relate them to the small t-shirt. So that way, if the user likes a small red t-shirt, then they might like a medium red t-shirt as well. So all we need to do here is we need to get the key product ID of one product and stick it into the key related product ID. We're going to relate the red small cotton t-shirt product to the medium red cotton t-shirt. So we paste in its unique identifier. And now in all the related columns here, it can find the associated product that it exists within the data set as well. We do have the is active, is updated columns, the date columns and the note columns as well. If you wanted to relate this one product to many different products, we just need to enter the same product ID within the new record and then we find our other products that we may want to relate it to. So we might want to relate the small red product also to the small blue product. So we just get its unique identifier here and then we might also want to do the same for the uh, the green product as well. If we reload the data within this data set, we can see now the small red cotton t-shirt is now related to the, both the small green, the small blue, and we've got a duplicate uh, product here. So we'd want to change that to the medium red product just by doing that. So we can go through, through each of our products and then starting to work out how we want products to be related to other products within this tab here. Now, once we've done that, we then go back into our generic adapter where we then need to set up a item relations data export. So we sign that to our SQLite data set. Now the table that this data is stored in is called item relation. We also only want to get out active records. Once that's data saved in the data fields, we only need to set up two of these fields. Uh, it's the key product ID and the related key product ID. So we assign them into the custom field definitions. And in the future, these concepts of downloads and labor will allow us also to link labor. That's work required for one product, maybe links to that or downloads or other things that people can download. But for now, we just need to worry about products. We can test out the export to make sure we have configured it correctly. And we can see here that it has been able to get out the data that we had set up in the data set. After that, we only need to reload the fields. Go back into the export routines window and click on the item relations data export then choose the platform that we want to export that data out to and click the run once off or add it to a schedule to have that data updated on a regular basis as well. So that shows you an example of how to set up the data to assign image files to products, to assign attachment files to products as well as to link products to other products. 
And the data for all these can also be imported into a data set. So we, we can import data from other systems into the data set and assign that data. That is all possible once again using the adapters, setting up the associated adapter. So if we wanted to get the product image data from the Micronet system that we are already storing within it, go into the export routine schedule window, choose the product image export and instead of choosing one of their platforms, choose the connected data set and then we can import that into the data set that we have set up. And so that means that if you're previously storing or managing image or attachment data or related product data in other systems that you can then import that data into the data set and start off with a working base rather than trying to create all this data from scratch which it may be very useful if you've already been previously doing this in CSV files or other accounting and ERP systems. Within the 1.15 connector release cycle, we've added additional functionality into the MyAB account right adapter to be able to import an exporter from MyAB account right company files that are hosted on MyAB's cloud. So if we choose from the MyAB account right adapter, it has now been renamed to the MyAB account right cloud or 2013 plus adapter. We give that a name. So we will give that a key such as MyAB AR cloud. Then within the MyAB account right settings window, we now need to set up settings to allow the adapter to connect to the MyAB cloud and access a business's company file. Now this process is a little bit complex. MyAB have made it a little bit difficult in order to set up these credentials. So I'll take you step by step through these settings to be able to get access, to be able to read and write data to an account right company file stored on the MyAB cloud. So the first thing we need to do is we need to clear out this account right URL address that is set by default is only relevant if the MyAB account right company file is self hosted on your own computer. That means it's not stored on the cloud. So we need to clear that out. And the company file GUID or the unique identifier of the company file, we can only find this out once we have been given access to the company file on the MyAB cloud. So in the next setting, the account right username, we need to specify the username and password of a user that we would log into the MyAB account right company file with. And that user ideally has read and write access for the majority of the company files since the adapter needs to have those permissions to be able to do its job. So if we logged into the MyAB company file with a user called connector, then we would just set the password that we use then in order to, to connect to the MyAB software. Now this next setting is the MyAB developer key. This key is generated by MyAB when a, either a partner pays a license to MyAB to be get Axe API credentials and to allow their software to connect to MyOBS cloud. You can get these keys either through a MyOB partners, which I would say would be the recommended approach, or otherwise you can ask MyOB in order to create your own keys and your own get your own developer license. If we're working with a partner, I'll put in their developer key into here. And the next option is a new setting where we need to choose if the MyOB account right file is self-hosted, and that means it's stored and accessed in our own computer network, or whether it's stored and accessible from the MyOB cloud. So we would choose the cloud in this example. We've now got a number of cloud settings that we need to set up if we're going to connect to the company file on the cloud. So the first thing is this MyOB cloud authentication URL. This is the URL that the adapter uses in order to verify itself and then for the MyOB cloud to give credentials to be able to access the company file. By default, you don't need to change this setting, but in the future, MyOB may change this domain if they decided to change their APIs. Now, the next setting here is the MyOB developer redirect URL. So when the MyOB developer uh, sets up API credentials, not only did I set up a key, but they also set up a specify a URL that their application will redirect to. So if you're buying your own API credentials or your own license, you'll be able to specify that domain. Otherwise, you need to talk to the partner for the URL that they have set. In my example, that URL has been set to the squiz.com platform. And so we just need to set its domain there. Now this next setting is the my develop password. So just like how there was a, a key generated for the developer or the API, there is also an associated password that goes with the key and the redirect URL. So we just need to put in the password that either our partner has been provided with or set up or that we have been given uh, that we set up ourselves within MyOBS cloud platform. Now this last setting is called the MyOB Cloud Refresh Token. And this is a token that MyOB issues from its authentication software. And this refresh token 
is repetitively used in order to get an access token which allows the adapter to read and write data from the hosted company file. To get that refresh token, we have to use this utility that we've added to the adapter called the Myob Cloud Access Utility. So if we click on this button. Within this window, it allows us to do a few things. It allows us to get the cloud, the refresh token that we need to get. It also allows us to get the access token, which we can use to, to query data out in the query browsers if we want to look at the data that's coming in and out of the company file manually, as well as we can see the the company files that are hosted for one business in the Myob Cloud. To get all this data, it first relies upon us getting a Myob Cloud access code. Now to get that code, what we need to do is open a web browser. So we need to go open a web browser. We need to go to the my.myob.com.au website and click on the sign in button. We need to then sign in with the myob.myob account. And when you set up the company file to be hosted on the Myob Cloud, you would have need to have created a Myob Myob account for your company file. If you haven't already created one, well, you need to create an account with Myob first. Once we've done that, we click the sign in button. So we enter our credentials to be able to access the my.myob portal and click the sign in button. Once we are logged into the my.myob.com.au portal, the next thing we need to do is open up a new tab and we need to enter a specific URL into the browser that will grant the developer's software to be able to access the company file. So if we open up a new tab within the Myob Developer Center, under here, they specified a URL that we must set in and allow this to take place. So we need to copy this URL into a new tab. There's a few things we need to do with this. We need to first put in the developer key ID. That's the same key we put into this setting here. So it needs to be put in the URL. So let's just say we put our, our key looks like that. And in the redirect URL, we have to replace the square brackets with the URL that was set by the developer for their software. Now this needs to be encoded. So we need to go and find a URL encoder. If this is the redirect that we, we set up for it with our developer or our software that is allowed to be used in the Myob Cloud, then we need to copy in that URL into our into an example encoder. And then if we look at the encoder, you can see that it's changed the URL to contain these percentage and these other characters that allows the domain or the URL of this address to be embedded within the other URL. So we need to copy that encoded value, stick it into where the square brackets and this URL encoded redirect URI placeholder is set. We paste that into there. Then we don't need to touch anything else and we click the enter key to then load that URL. Now, if that has all worked out correctly, then the web page will reload to the, the URL that we gave to it. So in this case, we gave the squiz.com domain to it. In the URL of that page, it has set this code parameter and has given a big long value for that. So this is the Myob Cloud access code that we need to put in the utilities. So we need to copy the code from within the URL, everything starting after the equal symbol, right to the end, we copy that. Now this is also in an encoded form, so we need to decode that value. If we click, go back to our website, the URL decoder.org, we now paste our value in, and then we click on the decode button. Result here, we've got the decoded form of that code, and then we copy and paste that back into the Myob Cloud Access Utility within the connector and paste that in. Now this is a one-time use code. So once we click on this button we, and it successfully a, is able to generate a cloud refresh token, then we can no longer use that code again. It will be no longer valid. So we click the button there. We can see that the cloud access code has now cleared itself since it's no longer valid anymore. And that we've now been able to receive Myob Cloud Refresh Token. So we need to copy this refresh token and we'll just exit out of this window. And we need to paste it back in this setting here called the Myob Cloud Refresh Token. Now, if you get the any of these credentials uh, incorrect, then you won't be able to generate the Cloud Refresh Token since these credentials get passed into the Cloud Access Utility window. If we go back into the Utility window, you can see that the Cloud Refresh Token has been passed in from the, the setting that has been saved within the General tab over here. 
Now that we've got this refresh token, we can click the get my cloud access token. So this access token is what the adapter uses every time it wants to export or import data to an accompany file hosted on the my cloud. It will use the refresh token to generate an access token and then that access token is used to verification of Myob's API and once that has been validated then it can try to push and pull data in. Now before we can do that we first need to know the company file that we're going to push and pull data from. So that's where we get into the next section is where we need to call this URL the API in order to find company files exist based on the company that was linked to the access code originally up here based on who we logged in within the MyDob MyOb portal. So click on this button. So we can see that it's found one company here called Acme Party Limited. That's the that's the company file that's hosted on the MyOb cloud. That company file has a here's the unique identifier of that company file as well as here is the URL that we need to specify that the adapter needs to call in order to get the data out of that company file. Now there's some other things that we can find about it. The company file, what version is it running as, which country the company file is registered against and the serial number of that company file as well. So we need to copy first the this GUID or it's a global unique identifier. We copy that value and then we paste that into the company file GUID here. Now if we go back to the My Cloud Access, if we click the get My Cloud Access token again, that will give us the token, then we can click and that will get us the company files again. So the other setting that we need to get is the URL that MyOb is hosting our company file on. So we need to copy this URL, but we want to get everything before the GUID is in the URL and the slash. So we copy everything from here and then we close this window and we copy that address into here. And now we have all the credentials required for the adapter to be able to connect, validate itself and then access the data. Now, once we've got all that correct, we can now test the connection to see if we can successfully connect to the cloud. And if you've if that has been all successful, then you will get a, a message here saying the connection has successfully been made. So that that's how we know we've passed all the tests. If we haven't passed all the tests, then we need to go back through each of the settings and then check that we've got the right data and maybe regenerate the refresh token again, as well as check that we've got the correct credentials for the company file. Now the next thing we want to may want to do is try to test the kinds of data we can pull out from the company file because we're going to we may need to configure the data coming out of it uh, for each of the data exports. So if we go back into the My Cloud Access utility and we generate another cloud access token, we copy that value and then we go into the data exports tab and choose where we want to get the data from. So say we want to get out the tax codes that exist in this company file, so we choose the tax codes data export. If we then go into data fields, already all these fields they will already be configured to get the data out of the company file and we can test this out and query the data coming out by clicking on the test export query. So that will open up a JSON XML query browser and already have the credentials that we needed set within the URLs as well as getting the data from the lo right location with its in the API. We need to paste the access token that we received in the access utility into here so we need to change everything in the square brackets and paste that value in. We also need to set a base64 string containing the myob user and password that we're using to connect to the company file. So that is the same settings we configured here with the username and password. So it needs to be base64. So that would be the connector user in our example. Put a colon and then we put the password of that user we'd log into myob with. Click the encode button to give us the base64 encoded string that we need to put in the URL. So we copy that. Go back to the query browser, paste that value here in the location where the square brackets are. Paste that in there. Then we can now run the query that will then try to retrieve the data from the API. If all is successful, when you click the run query, you'll see in the result set tab, you'll see the result from the MyAB company file. So if we look at this, we can see that in our company file hosted on the MyAB cloud, we have a number of different tax codes that are stored. We have a GS3 tax code. We have some luxury car tax codes. We've got some import duties, uh, wine taxes, and many other different taxes that have been set up in that company file. So this allows you to confirm that you've got the right data. So a very important thing to note is when you're using the cloud access utility to generate the access tokens in order to be able to query out the data, these access tokens only last for 20 minutes. After that, they become invalid. So you 
You're configuring the data exports or the data import. The data exports, you may have to continually go back here to generate a new access token, just like how the adapter does when it automatically exports and imports data. Unfortunately, you might have made this quite a complex process um, that requires multiple layers of authentication and verification, um, and that's in order to safeguard security. So it's important to note here by using this process, you're granting your company file to be used by other software, in this case, the connector software, to be able to pull and push data out automatically. With the 1.15 connector release, we've also added a small improvement to when exporting category data out of generic adapters. And if we go into the settings window here and click on the data exports tab, if we're exporting out category data, previously you needed to configure both category and category products data exports to be able to allow a list of categories to be exported to the associated e-commerce platform or data sets, as well as you need to configure the category products. So that means the, the data export that assigns products to categories also need to be configured. So the change we've added is that if the category export is no longer set to any data source and there's no data assigned to it, then the category data can still be exported out from the adapter and it will just be missing any of those product relationships with the categories. Uh, the last change we made is to the Data Power Warehouse Management System adapter. And when orders are imported into the Data Warehouse System, if we look at a sales order that could be imported into it and go into the lines, for each product line, there is ability to set a, both a product name and a product description. Now, previously, when sales orders were being imported in the Data Power WMS system, the text that was displayed in the description here is the text that would be assigned against the order line description in the WMS system. The change we've made is now to put the item or the product name in the description field in the WMS's sales order since it is a short description field in that system whereas the description field here is a long description that can may contain lots of data. So it makes more sense to use the product name field as opposed to the description to set that data up. If you're using a data pal system, you need to be aware of this um, and you may need to change uh, data exports of how you're setting up your product names to make sure that you're getting the correct data out. So that's a wrap up of the Connectors 1.15 release. We highly recommend subscribing to the Squiz.com YouTube channel where you can receive future notifications about the great things we release. And you can also find more information about the connector within the squiz.com slash docs.connector documentation center. Until next time, thanks for taking the time to listen. Have fun with the connector.